Okay. So we essentially started with you guys having a, a basic knowledge of, of cardiology, pathophysiology with cardiology, um, basic knowledge of, of what strips do you shock, um, basic knowledge of strip interpretation, then, then we went from there, ran with it, and at this point now you've went through just about all the arrhythmias, um, well all of the arrhythmias in your educational standards. We've went through um, cardiac specific diseases, we went through 12 lead. You've had a, a, a large amount of material over the past four months that's been uh, placed on you, and I feel like that you, um, I feel like that you, you, you started to get it for some of y'all. You, you certainly got frustrated there about the mid to the end of February when we were doing these strips, and, and some of you guys may still feel a little bit frustrated, but it's one of those things that I promise you that, that you will continue to work with. You will see this stuff every day. We may not go back and go through all the five steps of rhythm recognition and all that stuff when we look at strips, but if you look at them enough, if you apply them enough to your, to your patient, if you understand the pathophysiology enough, it will click, it'll come. So, with that being said, what I'm going to do is we're going to briefly look at the electrophysiology. Um, I'm not going to go really into the anatomy at this point. I really feel like you should have a strong foundation in the anatomy. I'm going to briefly touch on the electrophysiology as far as the, uh, um, the, the action potential and, and depolarization, repolarization as far as some of that's uh, concerned and those different phases in the electrolytes. And we're going to move on into the, um, to the, to the rhythms, the, the strips. We're going to review some of that stuff. And then we're going to look at um, uh, treatments, ACLS treatment guidelines, because that's mainly where a lot of that stuff comes from. And then I'm going to make mention of a few other things um, that, that I feel like are pertinent that, that may not have just gotten put into a slide on, on this uh, presentation here. So. As far as electrophysiology goes, it's important for us to understand that, that there's two different types of, of cells and they all work together as far as cardiology or cardiac cells go. Now, we do know that, that the heart cells themselves are muscle cells, but they've got some unique aspects to them, some unique uh, 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 characteristics about them that, that other muscle cells don't, and, and that's what makes the heart do what it does. Of course, you've got your myocardial cells, which are the cells that receive the stimulus and then contract. So these are your muscle cells. These are your worker cells. When you talk about certain aspects of, of cardiology, and you think about contractility and the ability for, for cardiac cells to stretch and all and, and release, which law comes into mind? Starling's law, Starling's law. So, so your myocardial cells are the ones that, that Starling's law would affect. Um, essentially, what does Starling's law say? The greater the expansion, the greater the contraction. Right. The greater the expansion, the greater the, the contraction, right? When you, when you think about some of the terms that we've learned this semester as far as <laughs> preload and afterload and all that, what would affect Starling's law the greatest initially? Preload. Preload. Uh, in diastolic volume, or an uh, easier way to think about it, is the amount of fluid that's in the heart that, that comes back to the heart. So more fluid coming to the heart in a healthy heart that's beating, more of a myocardial stretch, more of a what? Cardiac output. Then, of course, your pacemaker cells. These are going to be the cells that generate and conduct electrical impulses down the conduction pathway of the heart. Now, there is a principle that, that um, um, pacemaker cells or, or your, your electrical cells um, have that, that is a good thing, but it also can be a bad thing when you start getting ectopic foci firing off. And that's the all or none principle. Remember that, the all or none? Either we're going to reach, if, if just one cardiac cell reaches this action potential threshold to where it's going to create an electrical conduction, then it's going to conduct all the way down. 
no matter where it originates from. And so that makes sense when you think about ectopy and you think about dysrhythmias. When you have these ectopic foci, if you have one ectopic foci, one cell that's a rogue cell that decides to create its own electrical impulse, then from that point down or that point up, if it goes retrograde, that's where some dysrhythmias ar arise from. Does that make sense? Um, myocardial cells, um, they're bathed in electrolyte solutions with three of the most important electrolyte uh, being what? Sodium, potassium, and calcium. Sodium, potassium, sodium, potassium, and calcium. Sodium, potassium, and calcium. Sodium, potassium, and calcium. They are, are three of your, your um, most important electrolytes as far as normal function. Now, we also know that when it comes to arrhythmias, there's another electrolyte that could have a, a, a bearing on um, cardiac function, and that's what? Magnesium. Magnesium. All right. Um, so with your potassium, your potassium, it... it and your uh, sodium, both of those play a, a big function in depolarization. Potassium is, is very much necessary for repolarization. So depolarization is going to be your contraction, right? And repolarization is going to be going back into your resting potential, right? Why is it called depolarization? It depolarizes, and in, in layman's terms, it changes polarity and charge. So you go from negative to positive. So just a quick, quick um, review. Let's just say that this is your cardiac cell. During the resting potential, during the resting potential, the cardiac cell intracellularly is filled with what? There you go. What's on the outside? Nah. Nah. Nah, 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 Batman. <laughs> All right? So this would be considered resting potential. So where does polarity come in? Well, the intracellular aspect of the cardiac cell during resting potential relative to the extracellular atmosphere or environment is what? Negative. And the outside is positive. Now, most of your cells have what's called a semi-permeable membrane, right, that helps and aids in, in, in um, um, osmosis and, and fluid um, stability, equalization. And so with that membrane, your larger solutes, such as sodium and potassium, are not able to transfer across the cell membrane unless they have what? Uh, a structural piece of the cell. All right, so your protein gates, right? Your, and with sodium and potassium, it's the sodium-potassium pump. So it's your little protein gates that, that aid in what? It's called what transport? Active transport, which means that it requires energy. All right? And so for, for depolarization to occur, you've got to have the propagation of an action potential. And we're going to get to that in just a minute. All right, so this just goes back to what, I got a little bit ahead, but this is what, what we just talked about. During your resting um, potential, your potassium ions are greater inside of the cell, and your, your sodium ions are greater outside of the cell, and that's where your active transport has to come in. And so in order for your active transport to, to occur, you've got to have energy, brings in sodium rapidly, and it's a slower release of potassium, right? Remember your, your uh, phases, and we're going to talk about that in just a second. All right? So your, your four uh, primary cell characteristics, contractility. What does that mean? 
has the ability to physically contract. This is going to be a mechanical function. You've got to have that contractility. But you cannot have that contractility without your other properties. Your automaticity, which is the ability to spontaneously generate electrical impulses without external stimulation. Now, this is okay in the event that you need a cardiac cell or you need a new um, um, area to take over pacing, right? SA node goes out, then the AV node will start pacing. But one of the issues with automaticity is excitability, right? Excitability, the ability of the cardiac cell to respond to an electrical <laughs> stimulus most of the time, it's of an outside influence, um, sympathomimetic stimulants, things like that. They start getting irritated. Then they just decide they want to just start firing on their own, and then boom, bam, they fired. And then under the all or none principle, you have the conductivity to where now we've got that ectopic foci that's been irritated, it's been poked and prodded by this cocaine that this joker took and, and he's just getting so excited and irritated. Boom! He releases, he hits his threshold, his action potential, and then every cell connected to him does the same thing, does the same thing, does the same thing. And then if that, that, that stimulus continues, you keep having that stimulus continue and that irritability continue, then we're going to keep having more and more ectopic foci. And the next thing you know, you've got a heart that instead of doing this, is doing this and is going crazy, right? And so now we can talk more about your four primary cell characteristics in, a, in, in, in relation to your, your dysrhythmias because you understand the dysrhythmias and you understand sites of origination and you understand ectopic foci and you can understand why, yeah, this is pretty cool that they've got these characteristics and it does help out when it comes to compensation and things like that, but it can also be a double-edged sword, right? Because we need that heart to, to, to fire from the SA node, to go down your internodal pathways, down to the AV node, down to the bundle of his, down to the, uh, your bundle branches, then to your, your fascicles, your Purkinje fibers. We need it to go normally, but when things don't go normally, the electricity just don't stop. And if it does stop, then there's certainly an issue there as well. All right? So that was just kind of thrown in. I should have put that a little earlier, but that's all right. Um, your cardiac depolarization, this is going to be where your sodium ions rush into the cell, changing the interior charge to positive. Now, one of the things that we do know is that, that potassium is a positively charged ion, even in its resting state, and, but in relation to the amount of sodium and the charge of sodium on the outside, it is relatively negative compared to sodium. Does that make sense? So it's not that you've got a negatively charged ion in here, it's just because of the, the capacity of, of what's inside of the cell compared to the outside. All right? So with cardiac depolarization, this is where you have to have those sodium ions rush in. And potassium <coughs> ions slowly leak out. Remember, the, the rate of exchange is much higher. You have more sodium coming in than you do potassium going out. And then once you've hit that threshold, then you have cardiac repolarization, and that's where your sodium ions go back out and your potassium starts coming back in, all right? So that gets you to this, your action potential. Oh, crap, we've seen so many ways, so many different things and all that. But if you just look at it in relation to what's happening here as far as the charge, and that's what it is, is that this is, this is your charge, and this is the time it takes, and these are in milliseconds, in milliseconds, and so you have your, your phases here. With this phase, phase zero, you have a rapid, rapid influx of what? Sodium. Sodium. So that's why your charge goes from negative 90, give or take, to a positive 20 really quickly, right? Because your sodium is rushing in. Then you get into your, your other phases as well. Um, 
Sodium stops entering the cell once, it, once the inside has become positive. Phases one through three represent repolarization. In phase one, potassium begins to leave the cell, slowly returning uh, the cell to its normal negative charge. Phase two interrupts with an influx of calcium. What does that do? What does that influx of calcium do? Remember here, not initially, remember what, what has, exactly. So if you notice that these phases are kind of in relation here to where the big contraction occurs, all right? Then um, the muscles are using calcium inside the cell for contraction. The plateau phase delays repolarization and is important for medications that affect the strength of contraction. Phase three is marked by cessation of calcium influx and a rapid efflux of potassium. Phase four is normally your flat stage representing the what? Resting potential, all right? So again, if you think about it in relation to what we've just talked about with depolarization and repolarization, here, we're here, all right? We're negative, we've got potassium. Then we hit here, we're ready to start having a, a, a um, cardiac cycle, so you have a rapid influx of sodium. Boom! We go really, really, really quickly, right? Then you start having a pretty quick outflow of, of, of sodium, right? Did I, I think I said an influx of potassium, then an influx of sodium. Then you start having a real slow um, um, influx of, of potassium back once you start getting over here. But then you hit phase two, and that's where what we were just doing with our sodium and potassium that's kind of interrupted because we got to have contraction, right? So the point of, of sodium and the potassium pump is to change the polarity, and then the point of calcium is to hit in and, and stimulate the cell to contract, right? And so understanding that helps you to understand some of the cardiac pharmacology that you get, calcium channel blockers and things like that, okay? Any questions about those before we move on? I just wanted to briefly review. I didn't want to spend a ton of time with that, but I just wanted to make sure that, that you remember that because it's been a little while since we've seen it. Good? All right. So with your electrical conduction system, just a brief review. You got your SA node. And while we're talking about this, let me bring this up. What is your inherent or your intrinsic firing rate of your SA node? 60 to 100. FISDAP says 61 or 60 to 99. Right. So I, I tell you that so that you don't get confused if they ask, what is the pacemaking rate of the AV node? Well, it goes, what, what, what do we say it is? 40 to 60 of the AV node. AV node is AV node is 40 to 60, right? Yeah. They say 40 to 59. All right. What about your bundle of hiss or your 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 bundle there? Your Purkinje fibers, your ventricular pacemaker. 20 to 40. All right. I'm just telling you that if you see a nine in there. Go with what's the closest to what you're used to knowing. All right? So, going back really quickly though, your SA node. What is one of the biggest uh, stimuluses of your SA node? Hmm? It's part of your nervous system. So your sympathetic and parasympathetic nervous system have a huge control over your rates, right? SA node, if this working normally, 60 to 100, we're pacing. Remember, your atria, they both contract at the same time. Your ventricles both contract at the same time, right? You have your SA node. It fires, it propagates, uh, action potential. All or nothing principle. Now we're going down 
with through with conductivity and then contractility. So we make it here. We we've got our Bachmann's bundle over here because the left side needs to be contracted as well. Now we 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 went through. We hit the AV node. The AV node kind of acts as the gatekeeper, right? What is one of the things that under a normal functioning electrical conductive system does the AV node do? That's right. It allows the delay. Then you got the atrial kick where you got about the rest of your 30% of blood that needs to get pushed on down. Now, one of the things we also know is that the, the ventricles are much more muscular than the atria. So, they are designed to be on top for a reason because gravity helps aid in that as well. But then you go through the, the AV node. It's held it up for just a, a, a very small, minute amount of time. Then we hit the bundle of his. A bundle of his then bifurcates into your right and left bundle branches, right? And they continue on. You've got your classicals and you've got your Purkinje fibers. Pretty easy stuff, right? Pretty easy stuff. Alright, so your routine monitoring. What is what is something that a electrical cardiograph, an ECG, what is something it can tell you? Alright, it can tell us what's happening with the electrical function of the heart. What can it not tell you? The mechanical function. So good cardiac assessment involves several facets with being one being the ECG monitor, but it's not your end-all tell-all. How do you also confirm mechanical function? Pulse, perfusion, what's the big key one, especially when we're looking at arrhythmia treatment? Blood pressure. Alright? So it will tell you rate and regularity and time to conduct an impulse, but with your single <coughs> leads, which is what we, we looked at through the whole month of February, it can't tell you really a whole lot of area of infarct or injury, oh, axis deviation, chamber enlargement, right to left differences in conduction, and quality and presence of pumping action, all right? P wave represents what? All right, atrial depolarization. Now, atrial depolarization does have to have atrial repolarization, but it is not shown on a ECG waveform, right? Why is that? Right, because it takes a lot more <coughs> energy, a lot more electricity to cause a ventricular conduction or ventricular depolarization than it does for atrial repolarization, so it's hidden there. All right? Your QRS. QRS is going to be a direct representation of what? Ventricular depolarization. And then, of course, you've got your T wave, which is going to be what? Ventricular repolarization. And then, in the occurrence that you have a U wave, usually U waves occur when you have what? Hypothermia. Hypothermia is a common cause of a U wave. All right? Now, we know that, that, that anatomically, the heart is two pumps, right? It has two functioning systems in one. But we only see one waveform, even though we have two, two atria that are getting depolarized and two ventricles getting depolarized. And why is that? They're on a synctium. Remember that term? They're on a synctium. They're supposed to occur at the same time. And that's where some of your, your dysrhythmia identification, like with bundle branches and things like that, arise. is because you've got two depolarizations occurring, but not at the same time. All right? Your PR interval, greatest it should be is 0 0.20, right? QRS, 0 0.8 to 0 0.12. You start getting greater than 0 0.12, then we're going to call this a, a wide complex. Then, of course, your ST segment. What's important about uh, your ST segment 
What's important? Where's an area that you should be trying to identify? The the J point and see where it's sitting in relation to the baseline, your isoelectric line. And then you've got your QT interval, your QT. What implication does the QT interval have? You what? Absolute refractory period. Well, you, yeah, yeah. That is part of your absolute refractory period. But I'm just, I'm just talking about what does the QT, what does that interval represent? What does that tell you? How long is taking for the ventricle to depolarize? Now, what can affect? What, what's one of the big things that can affect the QT interval? There's that one medication that we talked about a lot. Digoxin. Now, there are other things that can affect the QT interval. And when you start having longer QT intervals, that represents a longer ventricular depolarization. All right? <laughs> so, with your ven um, ventricular, I don't know what I'm talking about there. With your rhythm identification, I would still recommend that when you go to take your final, and even right now, when you're, when you're looking at rhythms, even if you don't write them out, you need to mentally go through them. Twelve leads the same thing. <coughs> Identify rate. Identify rhythm. Now, that's not rhythm interpretation, what is that when we identify rhythm? Regular is it regular or irregular? Identify your P wave. Look to see are there any abnormalities. Do you have a P wave for every QRS? Are there more P waves than there are QRSs? Do you even have a P wave? Is it inverted? Then look at your PRI. Your PRI is going to tell you how long it's taking what? Your PRI is going to tell you how long it's taking from your atria to your ventricles, right? To get ventricular depolarization and then your QRS complex. Well, your QRS complex. How wide is your QRS? Is it wide and bizarre? Do you have a, a especially now that we've talked about 12 lead and stuff like that, what does your Q wave look like? Is it benign? Or do you have um, a pathological Q wave? Is it greater than one third the depth of the, or the height of the R wave? Do you have a P wave for every QRS? Do you have extra QRS complexes in there? If you do, do they look the same? Do they look different? So there's a lot more to it than just those five steps. You've got to look at, at, at the whole thing. Now, when you're doing it though, there's a lot of this stuff that just kind of comes naturally and pops in your head that you start to identify and you shouldn't be getting to that point where when you see a cardiac rhythm you can kind of mentally go through those steps and identify areas of abnormalities. All right. Remember with your heart rate determination you've got a couple of methods. The six second method is the easiest method. Um, <sighs> The six second method is usually um, recommended on arrhythmias when they're not regular. That way we can just get a quick reference. With regular rhythms, you can get a more accurate heart rate if you do the R to R. And so how do you do that? So you find an R wave and you count the big boxes in between them, then you divide them by what? 300. All right. So with your rhythm, remember you've got regular and irregular, but then you've also got regularly irregular, or I like to call it predictably irregular. A good example of that, by Gemini, PVCs that are unifocal. You see a line of those and you start having a, a PVC 
and then it hits again in the same rhythm. That's not regular as far as the whole strip is concerned. It's irregularly regular or predictably regular. We know when the regularity is going to hit. But then you've got that, that irregularly irregular. And it's simply that just means that, that my strip has irregularities occurring in it and I don't know when they're going to occur. I can't predict when they're going to occur. The most common one with that is going to be a atrial fibrillation. All right? With well, your wave review, we've already talked about those. Um, with your, your, your Q wave on your QRS, your first negative downward deflection, your R wave, your first upward or positive deflection, and then your S wave should be sharp negative downward deflection that follows the R wave. Now, when we're talking about 12 lead and we look at 12 lead stuff, this, um, this is where we can see some of those irregularities. Like with your S wave, sometimes with bundle branch blocks you'll have that big slurred S wave that's not sharp and not definitive. Am I talking over your head or are you good here? You, you remember some of this stuff. Good, good. And I did not mean that in a belittling way. I just want to make sure because I'm going through it really quickly. I just want to make sure that we're on board here. Alright. Remember your J point, the point in which the QRS complex meets the ST segment. Now, why, why would that have such an implication when it comes to injury and infarction? Why would your J point, if you think electrophysiologically and what's actually occurring, why would that be one of the areas that's of great concern? If it's elevated. All right, and so yeah, and y'all are on the right track. But I'm just trying to think think a little bit simpler here, which is going to be important when you take some of these tests is to think a little bit simpler <coughs> on some of this stuff. Crap, we're we're doing advanced stuff. It's hard to think simple, but you've got to. All right, if I've got a J point that that is not, if I've got an S wave and then a J point that is not sharp and defined and not returning back to the isoelectric line like I needed to, that's telling me that there is an issue with ventricular depolarization somewhere. And maybe not just with depolarization, but repolarization. We're not able to, to, to get those myocardial cells back to their resting potential. Is that because we've got an area of ischemia or infarction and things are going slower or things are not even occurring at all? Or is it, is it you know, some other issue? But your J point is going to be, be key if you think that you've got cardiac related chest pain for you to identify in your leads to figure out what's going on, all right? T wave, uh, ventricular repolarization or relaxation. Commonly seen as first upward or positive deflection following the QRS complex. Now, what is an electrolyte that could really affect the T wave? Um, Not magnesium, potassium. potassium. <coughs> All right, here's my P, here's my QR, S, and there's my T. All right, if I've got a tall spike T wave, Remember, look at this like a, a, a Boy Scout tent. I've got a lot more potassium in it. It's housing a lot more potassium, right? If I got a T wave that's just kind of flattening down and slurred, I may start having less potassium in it. If I've got a normal T wave, then hopefully I've got the normal amount of potassium in it. All right? So hyperkalemia can, can cause that tall spike T wave. Hypokalemia can start causing that T wave to flatten out. As you start getting dangerously high levels of potassium, then you start seeing a fusion of the T wave with the ST, and then you start seeing a fusion of the QRS complex with that, and then next thing you know, you're going to start going into some fibrillation here because of, of the high amounts of, of potassium. Does that make sense? Yes, it makes sense. 
All right. And then when we're looking at our strips, remember artifact. An artifact can sometimes be very difficult to differentiate, especially when you're in that mindset. This absolutely just has to be a dysrhythmia. There's no way that they're going to throw something on here that has got artifact in it. And I didn't see that the other day, but I'm not saying that they can't because they do have a test bank of questions that they put in these exams, even for registry. But the biggest thing that, that you should look at because even if it was an atrial fibrillation, the fibrillating baseline is not going to be this rigid, this chaotic. And also, look at your T, I mean your QRSs, and, and with AFib, remember it's irregular, right? In the case that you do have this, you do have artifact, first thing you should do is get your patient to sit still. Second thing you need to do is check lead placement. Make sure that they're connected. See if you've got it all grounded <coughs> uh, correctly. And if you continue to see this, then you may have an ECG monitor issue. All right? So, this is kind of Nick's take on things as far as treatment goes, as far as, as management. And, and really and truly, I have to think simple. I have to think um, categories and, and, and steps. And, and, and a lot of people that are like me, who are genetic learners, have to, to, to see how they can do it hands-on and, 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 and visually have something there. Um, when it comes to cardiology, even with cardiac specific diseases, anything that affects the heart, anything that affects perfusion, it all goes back to one thing, and that's going to be cardiac output. What is causing an issue with cardiac output? And what do I need to do to help restore cardiac output? Remember, whenever you're treating a cardiac patient, whenever you're treating a patient that, that has a dysrhythmia or some type of heart failure or something like that, we're not just treating a strip on a piece of paper. We're not just treating just the heart. We're treating the pump that perfuses the whole body, that perfuses the other organs, that, 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 that keeps things going for the body. And so, essentially, when it comes to dysrhythmias, is a heart beating too fast? Is a heart beating too slow? Because if it's beating too fast, that's going to have a direct result on cardiac output. If it's beating too slow, it's going to have a direct result of, on cardiac output. Is it moving at all? Is blood moving at all through the heart? And obviously that's going to have a huge implication. If all three of those are not in factor here, then what else, what other factor is affecting cardiac output? Then when you get to your, 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 your identification of, of the issue, you get your, 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 your field diagnosis, um, your differential diagnosis, when you get that figured out and you're forming your treatment plan, you got to think in steps to help you remember these algorithms. What's the least invasive thing I can do to treat this patient? What's the pharmacological treatment that's required for this patient? And what is the electrical treatment for this patient? And for these symptomatic patients, treatment's going to fall under those categories. But there's something... I throw, threw this cardiac output formula up here on purpose because something is affecting <laughs> cardiac output. And so you've got to see what do I need to do? What is that one thing that I need to do that's going to start the cascade of treatment? If it's too fast, is it a tachyarrhythmia? Well, we know that stroke volume is being affected but the main issue is not stroke volume affecting cardiac output, it's heart rate. If I've got a SVT that's beating at 180 times a minute and poor perfusion, then I know that really there's nothing that I can do to affect stroke volume that's going to improve their condition unless I slow their heart rate down. 
On the flip side of that, if I've got a bradycardic rhythm, a patient is symptomatic with a heart rate of 25, I know that I'm not going to be able to get good cardiac output because the heart's not pumping fast enough. So no matter what I do to try to affect anything else, I can give fluids, I can do whatever, but the fact of the matter is, is that if I don't speed the heart rate up, I'm not going to be able to get the end results that I need. And that's kind of the common theme on most everything. You've got to figure out what is that underlying issue that's affecting their hemodynamic stability. What is that one thing that I can start targeting in order to stabilize them? <clears throat> now, when we get into summer and we start talking about multi-system trauma and all that kind of stuff, it's going to be hard-pressed to find that one thing. And, and even here, this is kind of an elementary approach to it because a lot of times it's not that one thing, but as far as our treatment goes, you got to have a start point. You've got to have a focus. Does that make sense? So we are too slow. Your bradycardia. You've identified that this rhythm, whether it is a sinus or a block or whatever is a bradycardia. What algorithm am I falling under? One thing that I want to make mention on this bradycardia algorithm, and I think I've kind of covered it with you guys over the past few weeks, is that this algorithm is pretty much a top to bottom. There's not too many exit points. There's not too many exits to get off of to go down another road. It's pretty much top to bottom. The only time you exit is if they are stable, then you monitor them. Right? You've got that patient that's got a heart rate of 50, but blood pressure is fine, uh, mental status is fine, all that, then yeah, monitor and observe. Right? So your bradycardia is pretty much go down this algorithm. Now, while we're talking about the algorithm, Is there really anything that's least invasive? That means I'm not sticking, I'm not giving meds, I'm not electri electrically treating them. On the bradycardia algorithm, is there really anything? There's not. Because if it's a patient that's not going to require treatment, as far as any of that goes, then it's a patient that we're going to monitor and observe. All right. Even if it's a high degree heart block. Just because you've got a third degree heart block does not mean that we're automatically going to, to um, get out all of our stuff that, that, that we would use to treat. We got to look at their, their, their hemo, hemodynamic um, stability. But with your, your algorithm, your first and foremost is atropine. Atropine. Why is atropine an important medication in the bradycardia algorithm? doesn't it goes back to what I had talked about earlier as far as your 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 nervous system goes and your nervous system's effects on the heart right so so if I've got a sinus bradycardia the symptomatic chances are that bradycardia is being caused by Overstimulation of the parasympathetic nervous system, which in turn stimulates which nerve? Vagus, Vagus nerve, which is cranial nerve ten. 10. And when that nerve is stimulated, it stimulates the release of acetylcholine. Now, atropine is a, a parasympatholytic, also called an anticholinergic acetylcholine so it, it blocks the effects of acetylcholine if we block the effects of the parasympathetic nervous system what is the expected outcome to, to speed up to speed up all right so your dosages of atropine 0 0.5 milligrams with a max dose of 3 milligrams now Pharmacologically, if we follow the, the algorithm and they are refractory or not responding to atropine, then we can go with dopamine. 
Now remember, dopamine is not a, a secondary to pacing or anything. It is go to dopamine or transcutaneous pacing. Okay? And then you've got your epi infusion as well. Yes, sir. Did you get the three milligrams before you try another thing? Or did you, you would need to look at what their overall status is. I mean, if I've got that guy, 65-year-old man that, that's got a heart rate of 30, I give that dose of atropine. We're not really responding. We're continuing to, to decompensate. I'm getting on the phone and seeing which route do you want to go because atropine bolus alone is probably not going to help. All right. Atropine's only going to go so far, but if you've got a situation where you've got like a sick sinus syndrome or a failing SA node, again, the underlying cause, they're going to need repeated stimulation of that node. Does that make sense? <laughs> so when you're transcutaneous pacing, a couple of things that we've got to remember with transcutaneous pacing. The first thing is going to be lead placement. You've got to have all your leads on and you've got to have your pads on, right? Um, the other thing is that we can't just go by the monitor alone. We have to verify mechanical capture as well, all right? So I guess, again, I got ahead a little bit, but your atropine anticholinergic um, the, the big thing again is to remember how does bradycardia affect cardiac output and it's because the rhythm's too slow. The heart's not beating fast enough. All right. What about your dopamine? Well, the thing about it is is that, that your dopamine and your atropine, they both are used to treat bradycardias but they have entirely different classifications, entirely different mechanisms of action. Whereas your, your, your atropine works against the parasympathetic nervous system, your dopamine mimics the effects of the sympathetic nervous system. So it is a sympathomimetic. Now, have y'all seen this formula before? Okay, that makes the dopamine infusion so much easier. The concentration, but yeah, I mean, pretty much on anything that you're going to test, I would say 10 times out of 10, it's going to be with a, a 1600 mite concentration. Dose times weight times 60 drip set divided by 1600, and that'll get you very close to, to what you need. Now, I do have in towards the end of this the long way just to remind you how to do it. But hey, on this drug math stuff, you can find something that's going to get you the right answer. Roll with it. All right? So let's just, let's just say I've got a, I don't know, let's go with me, 205 divided by 2.2, all right, so 93 kilograms, all right. I want to start me at five mics. So five mics times 93 times 60, 27,900 divided by 209 patient, 209 pound patient would be at 18. So, so that, that, that's pretty close. All right, I would, I would, I would memorize that. Um, now, the, the good news is, is that, that in the field and in scenarios and all that, you'll always have this reference here. Because quite honestly, you got a patient that's decompensating that, that has issues. You don't have time to be figuring out this whole long math formula and all that stuff. They need dopamine. They need dopamine yesterday, right? <coughs> what about your epi? Again, it, it is a sympathomimetic, um, 2 to 10 mites. Now, um, one of the things that epi and dopamine are both going to affect 
is vasoconstriction. They both are going to cause an increase in blood pressure. may not be a bad thing, but you do need to watch that. You do need to titrate. My recommendation is usually to start around five mics, but you do have that dose range. If you start at five mics and you give 17 drips a minute on dopamine, and you start doing trending vital signs, and the next thing you know, your blood pressures went up to 150 over 90, your heart rate's 120, then we need to back down. It's a simple fix, right? Don't just think, because this patient right here is, is laying with a heart rate of 20, and they are hemodynamically compromised, that you need to just jump to the highest dosage that you can give. Dose ranges, and again, this is just a... a Nick's take on things, just like jewel ranges with electrotherapy. Dose ranges are ranges for a reason, so that you've got room to work either way. All right? I like to go to five just because, you know, um, they say that, that, that really anything below five, two to four, whatever, really has more renal effects. Some of, some of that's been a little bit disproven. But if you start at five, you can go down if you need to, or you can go up if you need to, okay? Now, I, I did tell you the dose range wrong here on, on the new Brady algorithm is two to 20, two to 20, all right? Then your epi is two to 10 still, okay? So what do we look for? What are we, what are we going to, to treat under the bradycardia <coughs> algorithm? Well, of course, your sinus bradys with your first degree block, but you're not treating the block in this situation. You'd be treating the sinus brady. Again, important to remember, and we still struggle with this up until last week or a week before when we were doing static. First degree AV block is the only AV block that you're going to have an underlying rhythm, that you're going to note an underlying rhythm, which is usually going to be sinus bradycardia or sinus rhythm because you've got to have a P wave to determine a elongated PRI. If they're hemodynamically compromised, you can almost bet it's not the first degree heart block that's causing the compromise, it's the bradycardia. What about your heart blocks? Well, you've got your second degree type one for your winky box, your second degree type two, and your, your complete heart block or your third degree heart block, all right? Your blocks, the main ones we're talking about right now are the site, AV node, second degree, type one, type two. They do have a two to one AV block, which is two, two P waves for every one QRS. We didn't get real deep into that because I needed you to understand these others, but uh, probably won't see a lot of that. But if you ever hear of a two to one AV block, it's a simple thing. You look at your two to one, you got two P waves to one QRS. Where it could get, get confusing, where it could get confusing is with your second degree type uh, two. If you've got every other beat is a, is a conductive beat, then you'll have a P wave, then no beat, then another P wave. But with your two to one, those P waves are going to be under the same contraction. Okay? So what's your treatment? I mean, it's, it, it's pretty much going to be your, your bradycardia algorithm. We talked about your first degree, your second degree type 1. Um, this is rarely treated unless associated with bradycardia that results in significant reduced cardiac output. Again, follow the bradycardia algorithm. When you're type 1, it's, it's not a high degree block. <coughs> Again, just like with your, your, um, your first degree AV block, most likely your signs and symptoms are, are not being caused by the block itself, but more because of the slow heart rate. <coughs> You stand a little bit better chance of atropine working with something like this than with your higher degree AV blocks. The thing that you've got to watch out for, though, with your blocks, is that once you start seeing the blocks, you've got to be looking at their hemodynamics because a higher degree block 
could quickly progress to another block. All right. Don't rely on atropine for a type 2 second degree AV block, even though it is in the bradycardia algorithm. And it's always just that point of confusion there. It is part of that. Uh, you, you've got an IV set up. We can go ahead and give atropine, and on that rare occurrence, it may work. What do we need here? We need pacing. Because if you really look tried and true at this rhythm right now, you got a second degree type 2 within your six second strip you may be getting some contraction from this one but you're really only getting two contracted beats so that's where they can really start getting hemodynamically unstable will your third degree your complete AV block be careful with those be careful with those whenever you're looking at those because we had a third degree AV block the other day in static and, and a couple of you still you just you, you zeroed in on a couple of the P waves that may have looked like they were associated you've got to look at the overall six seconds there when you get them alright one of the things to also remember with your third degree AV block is that your SA node is doing its own pace making and then your bundle is doing its own pacemaking. That's why, let's just say, for instance, on this six second strip right here, I've got one, two, three, four, five, six. I've got a heart rate or a P atrial rate of 60, but then I've got a ventricular rate of around 35 or so. And that's because the pacemaker and the ventricles are doing their own thing. And we know that the intrinsic rate of the ventricular pacing is lower than the SA node. So if you see that rhythm and you start seeing funky placements, but regular placements of your P waves, but a rate is significantly higher than your, your um, QRS, that's one of the things to look at with your third degree heart blocks. Does that make sense? Good. I just think this thing's funny. I've already said it before, but remember, your heart blocks are like relationships. That P and that QRS, man, they just fell in love and they're hanging out all the time. They're going to the, the Miracles concert and, and, and hanging out and, and going out partying and all that, but, but something's happened. We're just not who we were when we first started dating, and, and now we start drifting apart a little bit in the P wave and the QRS. They're just not, they're happy, but... I don't know, there's just there's just something that's keeping us a little bit spaced out apart. And then, you know, one thing leads to the another and the next thing the P and QRS they, they, they decide to break up but but they really love each other. They really want to get back together. So sometimes you'll see the P wave out by himself hanging out, but then sometimes the P and the QRS are back together. But then that just ain't working out. We can't we we can't keep going on like this. This relationship we we're supposed to be one. We're we're supposed to be PQ for life. We love each other. But love's just not strong enough because really loving was just liking and lust and you know what? Let's let's just kinda hang out every now and then. Let's try to work it out. But now more and more frequently they're not together and you see the P wave out without the QRS, but then you see the P wave and the QRS out and you're like, hey, they're getting back together, but then you see the P wave without the QRS again and you know, it's just it's the, the, it's just slowly just just separating, and then they finally just bust it up. P waves doing its own thing. QRS is doing their own thing. They got uh, every other week in custody of the PVC, and they're just moving. <laughs> on. So, heart blocks are always kind of a struggle for for students to understand. And and if you if you understand the way the electricity flows through the heart and you understand what's going to happen if you have a block at the AV node, then you should understand that a little bit better. All right? So, y'all good on blocks. Can we move on? Cool. What about your tachys? You're too fast. Your tachyarrhythmias. Now, typically, typically, sinus tachycardia is not going to cause a whole lot of prolonging 
compromise. Right now, there's probably several of y'all who've drank a monster or two this morning or a Red Bull or a couple of cups of coffee or something and, and you're, you're sitting here tachycardic. Are we going to hook a monitor up to you and just start slamming you with meds and cardioversion? No, we're not. We're not because I would probably say most folks these days having to live off of caffeine and, and cigarettes and all that are not are, are probably better off if they are tachycardic. It's kind of like diabetes. Over time your body gets used to having a sugar at 200. Over time, and it's not good to live that way, but your body gets used to having a heart rate of 120. Your, your, heart gets, your, your body gets used to having a blood pressure of 160. It ain't good to live that way, but it doesn't require treatment. Most of the time, your tachycardia is going to be caused, your sinus tachycardia is going to be caused by some type of outside influence. Rarely are you going to have some kind of, of issue that causes is just sinus tachycardia. If you do, it's usually going to be because of some other underlying thing. Metabolic issues, such as fever. <clears throat> Anybody ever felt the heart rate of a three-year-old who has 103 fever? It takes off. It's gone. Anybody seen the heart rate of a 30-year-old that has 103 fever? It's fast. All right? Dehydration. Again, it's an underlying issue. If we gave all the adenosine we had in the box, or all the amiodarone that we had in the box, or somebody that's dehydrated, it ain't going to help. Right? So why, when are we going to treat tachyarrhythmias? Symptomatic. If they are symptomatic, and the general, general rule of thumb, some books say 160, some say 150, some say 170. Uh, the biggest thing here is that if you've got narrow <laughs> complex with a high rate, and they are hemodynamically unstable, treat the tachycardia. So what's affecting your, your cardiac output? That's going to be your rate, your heart rate. You, you Even more so in tachys than in bradys. At least in bradys, they do allow for some ventricular filling. But in tachys, we do not have the ability to fill up the ventricle. So if we don't fill the ventricle, we don't get what? Blood out. What goes in goes out. Minimal goes in, minimal goes out totally defeats the purpose of the atrial kick and the AV node holding up to allow ventricular filling because we're beating so fast. Which explains why the heart, the body tries to compensate in shock, especially hypovolemic shock, when we start having less preload coming in because the heart's trying to put out what's coming in, but with minimal amounts coming in, it has to get as much out as it can. All right? Ventricles are pumping too quick to allow for appropriate filling. Stroke volume is decreased because there's not enough blood filling to the ventricles, therefore decreasing output. Again, there are medicines that can help with stroke volume, but if you were to give something like dopamine in this situation, it does have the inotropic abilities to help with contraction, but it also has the sympathomimetic abilities so now we're going to take that heart rate of 180 and send it to 200, 220. That ain't going to do us no good. So what do we do? We look at their overall stability. Now, what could fall under your, tachy, uh, your tachycardia rhythms? You got your atrial fibrillation. You got your atrial flutter. <clears throat> oh, they want to charge me now. Hello. <laughs> you got your SVT, you got your monomorphic VTAC, and your polymorphic VTAC, and then other wide complex tachycardias. But there's something that's key here in all of these that they have to have in order for us to go down the following algorithm. They got to have a pulse. They got to have a pulse. All right? 
when you're going to treat a tachycardia, you've got to ask, are the symptoms being caused by the tachycardia? Or are the symptoms being caused by an underlying issue that one of the symptoms or one of the signs of it is tachycardia? <coughs> Prime example, hypovolemia. Hypovolemia. That patient may have a low fluid volume in the body and they are tachycardic. And they may be experiencing some signs and symptoms. But slowing down the heart rate isn't going to change the fact that they don't have enough fluid to circulate in the body, right? So we need to slow the heart rate. I mean, we need to give more fluids. We need to treat the underlying problem. Another example, which is a slippery slope. But anxiety, anxiety can cause heart rate of 130, 140. Fight or flight, sympathomimetic response, or sympathetic, you get what I'm saying here. Uh, but if I go into somebody that's anxious, and I, I'm like, okay, I'm going to start an IV and give you these meds and all that, you're just going to make it worse. You've got to calm them down. But if it's tried and true, a tachyarrhythmia that is causing symptomatic problems, then treat it. Unstable versus stable. Now, one of the big differences, and I keep saying this, but you need to make sure that you remember, is that there is a big difference between the bradycardia algorithm and the tachycardia algorithm. Meaning that the bradycardia algorithm, it starts at atropine. <coughs> it starts at atropine, as far as treatment goes, and it goes straight down. Atropine is always given. We don't make the differentiation for sinus bradycardia. Do we give Pacing, do we pace or do we do atropine? You do atropine first. You got a couple of roads that are diverging in the woods on the tachycardia algorithm and you got to decide which road you are going to take. You've got your identification of your treatment. We've got oxygen on them. We've looked at pulse ops. They are symptomatic. Are they symptomatic in the fact that now this tachyarrhythmia, we, we uh -oh. we, we've identified that the problems are being caused by the tachycardia, not by any other underlying symptom. So are they causing signs of shock or, or hypoperfusion? Hypotension, altered mental status, other signs of shock, ischemic chest discomfort, acute heart failure. If yes, we do what? We go straight to electrical therapy. Remember, you've got non-invasive therapy, pharmacological therapy, and electric therapy. Electric therapy is going to be the, the most dramatic, all right? But if they're not causing any of this stuff, you can still use your clinical reasoning and your critical thinking and determine that, hey, he may not at this very present time have these signs of hypoperfusion, but I do know that a patient, a person cannot sustain a heart rate of 180 and expect to stay very well perfused for a long time. So even though right now we don't have these, we do need to terminate this tachyarrhythmia. If this patient is alert and oriented, the first thing I'm going to do is non-invasive treatment. Can you act like you're pooping on yourself? Up here, not down here, up here. Can you, can you act like you're pooping on yourself? Can you bear down? Your book mentions parotid sinus massage. I only bring this up because I don't know where that's going to lie. I doubt it's going to lie anywhere where they're going to test you, but I want to make sure that you understand that if there's anything about a carotid sinus massage, it is strongly discouraged. But what do you do? You rub the carotid sinus. You do not rub them both at the same time. All right. What's other ways you can get somebody to vagal out? You can try to get them to cough forcefully. One tried and true way that they'd be pissed at you about is the old ice bucket challenge. Put something cold on the head. Probably don't want to do that in the ambulance. But if, if with your tachycardia algorithm, we've noticed that, hey, it is a narrow complex that is causing signs of hypotension. Let's go with synchronized cardioversion, or signs of hypoperfusion. Let's go with synchronized cardioversion. 
at a joule dosage of what? Narrow complex, 50 to 100. What if it is a wide complex? What's going to constitute wide complex? All right, VTAC, things like that. A QRS that's greater than 0.12. And remember, you can have a pulse with VTAC, right? <coughs> we decide, hey, they are hypoperfused. We're going to synchronize cardioverb at a rate of what? All right, wide regular for synchronized is 100. All right. I would know those. I would for sure know those. All right. It is a wide QRS. We decide it's greater than 0.12, so what do we do? All right, IV access, vagal maneuvers, but it's not causing persistent um, hypotension, things like that. We can consider a denison. All right. <coughs> Any odorone would probably work better for stable wide QRS tachycardia. Because with your wide complex, most likely your ectopic site of origination is in the ventricles. Whereas we know that a denison, why it works well for our SVT, is because it slows what? SA. Not SA, the next AV. one. AV. It slows conduction at the AV node. Whereas we may have to give an antiarrhythmic for something that's occurring at a lower site. Right? What about a beta blocker? Well, we recommend American Heart says soda law. If you see a drug in relation to cardiology that has lol at the end, L-O-L, that is going to be a beta blocker. And if all else fails, consider expert consultation. Get somebody that knows what they're doing. All right? So I just went over this. Your narrow complex, vagal maneuvers, the denison if regular. Also your beta blockers, your calcium channel blockers. All right? Then, of course, your, your non-invasive. Um, the, the easiest thing and <laughs> sometimes the, the funniest thing because you're like, Hey man, I need to I need you to bear down like you're about to take a boo boo, and they're like, say what? But if you can get them to do it, I've seen it happen before. Well, as a matter of fact, I did it in here that day and bagel myself down. Remember when we we um, I put myself on the monitor? Um, didn't I do that for y'all? Yeah. You did Must have been the class I liked. Never mind. <laughs> um, <laughs> <laughs> so anyways, y'all know how to do that. Um, uh, patients at risk for thromboembolism, advanced age, coronary artery disease, high cholesterol. If, if that patient is in an atrial fibrillation rhythm, even if it's tachycardic, you need to be under medical control guidance. We talked about this last week. You run a huge risk for somebody, especially that has chronic AFib, to have those thrombi in the atria. One of the biggest arrhythmias that causes, or the, the arrhythmia, main arrhythmia that causes stroke, is atrial fibrillation. All right. Talked about a denison. You've got your others, uh, cardizem or diltazem. That's a what class is that? Y'all did drug sheets on them. What class is cardizem? I'm not talking about one, two, three antiarrhythmic. What? What? Calcium channel blocker. You got your others: uh, amiodarone, <coughs> digoxin, verapamil, mag sulfate. All these can be used for treating tachyarrhythmias. All right. A denison primary drug in the treatment of stable narrow complex SVT. Rapid bolus, short half-life, rapid bolus, 6 milligrams and 12 milligrams. 
Hopefully, um, it interrupts re-entry pathways through the AV node and restores the rhythm in patients with SVT. So yeah, we can say, oh yeah, we're going to give that a denison and that, that thing is going to stop the heart and reset the heart, but pharmacologically, physiologically, it does much more than just stop the heart and reset the heart. It, it, it blocks conduction pathways, it slows conduction pathways to where we can kind of get reset and get back on a normal pathway, <coughs> all right? Make sure that you follow that by a 20 milliliter normal saline bolus. One to three seconds, pachow, then try to get your, your, your two tens close by, or um, if you got a 20 cc syringe, you got to get that in pretty quickly. Um, funny thing, the way drugs work, even if they got a short half-life, if you've got poor perfusion, and you got to think about that, you've got a tachyarrhythmia that's causing poor perfusion, and you're giving a drug to help, what's going to happen if you got poor blood circulation? It's going to take more than three seconds to get to the heart in some cases. So that's why you rapidly give it and rapidly flush. Rapidly flush. All right? Your, your delta's in, your cardiz in, calcium channel blocker. It slows conduction. It's a calcium channel blocker. So what does it do? It, it, it blocks the actions of the calcium channels. Woo! Controls ventricular response rates and AFib, flutter, and multifocal atrial tachycardias. Cardizin is probably going to be your drug of choice if you've got like an AFib um, that's causing some symptoms. Used after adenosine to treat refractory reentry SVT. Sotolol, non selective beta adrenergic blocking agent used to treat ventricular and supraventricular dysrhythmias. In other words, it doesn't decide, it, 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 it doesn't select which adrenergic site that it's going to work on. It, it has beta 1, beta 2 blocking effects, but that's pretty much what it is. It is a non selective it, it, beta 1 or beta 2 beta blocker. So it can, it, 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 it can block the effects of either one of those. Dose is 100 milligrams or 1.5 mg per kg. <laughs> it's also a class 3 anti dysrhythmic. And that's probably why they like to use soda law because it does have the anti dysrhythmic properties as well. What about amiodarone? Class 3, anti arrhythmic agent. Used to treat both uh, uh, supraventricular and ventricular arrhythmias. It's primarily used to treat VFib, VTAC, and cardiac arrest. All right? They use me to protect you from recurrent life-threatening ventricular fibrillation and ventricular tachycardia by decreasing the cardiac <coughs> conduction and automaticity. Okay. Amiodarone dosing for uh, pulseless VTAC arrest mm -hmm. and VFib 300 followed by 150. Infusion, don't forget that, infusion, 360 milligrams over six hours. If you got a stable Y complex, VTAC is 150 over 10 minutes. Y'all know that. Y'all are good with that. All right. What are we going to treat here? Mag, Mag sulfate. One to two grams. One to two grams. Torsades, de pointes. All right. Additional medications that may be used with VTAC with a pulse. Epinephrine, very rarely. Vasopressin, not there. Um, should be taken out. But lidocaine. Epi is considered a vasopressor. Why do we give uh, epi? Because of, number one, it's vasoconstriction effects. So it helps with overall systemic vascular re resistance. It helps with blood pressure. It helps uh, uh, tighten the pressure down to get preload back. Also, a cardiac output. It happens to be a beta-1 adrenergic uh, um, agonist. And so it helps improve contractility increases heart rate, and increases conductivity through the AV node. One milligram of a one to 10,000. Now, one milligram of a one to 10,000, how many milliliters would that be? A 10 milliliter. IV infusion for bradycardia, one milligram is mixed with 500 mils of normal saline or D5W, and it should run at two to 10 mites per minute. Remember with your endotracheal tube. Med's given down the endotracheal tube. Um, <coughs> double the dose. Lean. Lidocaine, epinephrine, atropine, and Narcan. Yep. 
All right? Lidocaine. We didn't spend a lot of time talking about lidocaine this semester because it's been replaced with amiodarone, but it is still an accepted use of, uh, or an accepted drug that you may see questions about and you may see. As a matter of fact, if you work at ETS and you um, work at cardiac arrest, if it is a ventricular cardiac arrest, and it's time to give amiodarone, you will not find amiodarone, but you will find lidocaine. What is your lidocaine dosage? 1.0 to 1.5 milligrams per kilogram. Write that down, know that. 1.0 to 1.5 milligrams per kilogram. Now, why, is, why was lidocaine replaced? Because amiodarone is a much more versatile antiarrhythmic. Lidocaine only works on the ventricles. It's also useful for the treatment of stable monomorphic VTAC will preserve ventricular function, and for stable polymorphic VTAC will preserve left ventricular function, normal QT interval, and correction of any electrolyte imbalances. Seen this? Heard about this? Y'all following me? Following me? I know I'm going quick, but... <coughs> There's no reason for y'all not to do well on that final on, on Tuesday after going through this. If you're, if you're taking notes, just soaking it in, just being a good student that you are. Alright? 1 to 1.5 milligrams per kilogram, IV or IO. May give an additional 0.5 to 0.75 milligrams per kilogram for refractory VFib. For most situations, for most situations, an amp of, of an amp of lidocaine, a pre-filled syringe of lidocaine, comes in 100 milligrams. Usually, that will suffice. All right. For most adults. All right. Just like with amiodarone, if you um, if you uh, um, convert, you you need to do a uh, lidocaine infusion. Okay. All right. Gets us on into not moving. A systole, PEA, pretty easy. If it don't have a pulse but it has a rhythm on the monitor, it's PEA. Tried and true. Can be normal sinus rhythm, heart rate of 75, most beautiful <coughs> PQRS and T wave you've ever seen. Isoelectric line is perfect, but if they ain't got a pulse, it don't matter. The only time that you would treat a rhythm that doesn't have a pulse differently is if it's VTAC and we follow the VTAC algorithm. Does that make sense? All right. You got this, your number one treatment. And again, this is where your, your electrical therapy, your non-invasive treatment, and your, your, your pharmacological treatment come into play. Being as your non-invasive treatment is the number one most important thing that you can do for this patient without ever sticking them with a needle, without ever shocking them, without ever doing anything. If you do not do high quality compressions at a rate of 100 to 120, good pumping action with very minimal interruption, you do not save their life. You do not do any good for them. Make sense? Um, I don't know why I didn't include uh, VFib, VTAC, but again, with that algorithm, with your cardiac arrest algorithm, one thing's going to be certain that's going to be common with both of these, and that's going to be that they ain't got what? They ain't got a pulse. <coughs> if they are, they ain't going to be for long. If they don't have a pulse, then we need to determine, is it V-fib or V-tac? If it's V-fib or V-tac, we go down the right side. Immediately start CPR and as quick as we can, shock. Don't wait two cycles because remember your, train, train, your chain of survival. Your chain of survival. Immediate recognition, immediate activation, immediate CPR, and immediate defibrillation. Shock, shock, that's going to be, for VFib, VTAC, that's going to be 
If you want to rate levels of importance with CPR and shocking, they're right there together. Whereas IV and epinephrine's right there, intubation is down here, but CPR, shocking, and airway, basic airway management across the board, okay? Remember your two cycles, remember your drugs, your first line of defense, whether it's VTAC or um, assistily after CPR is going to be epinephrine. Your drug after that is going to be what for VTAC? At a, at a dose of what? 300 milligrams. 300 milligrams. If that don't work, we can give another dose at what? 150. What do we continually do every two minutes? Analyze that rhythm. And if we've been working this thing for 20 minutes and we don't have orders to terminate resuscitation, if we're still in VFib, VTAC, we do what? Shop. We shop. We shop. We shop. We shop. We shop. We shop. All right? Um... We don't shock on acetylene and PEA. CPR, epinephrine. Every 35 minutes, no max. What's going to be important goes back to what I was talking about earlier. Your underlying causes. What made them go into cardiac arrest? If it's one of these things here and it doesn't get treated, <coughs> then we're not really going to do anything but work a cardiac arrest. We've got to treat the underlying cause. Okay? All right. Feeling, feeling refreshed? All right. We got, um, we got some um, case studies I want to go through. Um, we're going to look at strips and all that, but we're going to take another five-minute break really quickly. We got a couple of case studies that I want to look through, and they're going to kind of go through the algorithms and things like that. I want to, I want you to um, uh, look at the strip. Let's, let's kind of go through the interpretation of the strip, and then we want to discuss the assessment for each patient, what we would do, and then um, figure out what treatment we're going to go down. All right. So case one: 65-year-old female, sudden onset of shortness of breath and fluttering in chest. Initial assessment, alert, and in mild respiratory distress, her airway is clear. She was vacuumed in the house when she suddenly became short of breath. She denies history of heart disease. She reports uh, periods of palpitations in the past. All right, what do you do now? All right, respirations are 20. Blood pressure is 110 over 90. SpO2 is 93% on room air. All right. <coughs> I know it's kind of tough to see here. You got a six-second strip there. All right. So the first thing is is rate. About 165, 170. All right. Rhythm? Do we got a P wave? I'll, I'll give you a hint. That's not a P wave. That's going to be an S. I mean, a T. So if we don't have a P wave, we don't have a PRI. All right? QRS. Narrow complex. So what are we going to call it? All right. Is she hemodynamically stable or unstable? All right, based off of what assessment? Which was 110 systolic? I just said it was 93%, but she is alert and talking to you. What uh, algorithm? Did y'all take some laughing gas or something before you came in here? <laughs> y'all are giggly like a giggly girl. I guess I'd rather y'all be happy than sad. All right. Adult, tacky with a pulse, hemodynamically stable, narrow complex, regular rhythm. So what's your treatment? 
Alright, so we're going to try to get her, get her to bagel. Bagel doesn't work. She's still stable. A denison. Six milligrams. If that doesn't work, twelve milligrams. Alright, so we've got her on one lead. What else should we do? Twelve lead. Alright. Yes, sir. We call him med control. Um, he may recommend giving um, um, a beta blocker. Um, he may recommend hanging part of them. He may recommend amiodarone, or he may just say, he or she may say, okay, as long as she's stable, just bring her in. All right, what else do we want to give with that IV? We want to give some, some fluids there to help with the, the medication and all that as well. All right, 58 year old male, found down, Un undetermined downtime. CPR was started by a first responder. Have them stop CPR and feel no pulse. What next? Resume CPR. Immediately, resume CPR. Then what? All right, then what? Why is there any hesitation here? What does he not have? It don't matter what it is, right? Does it? No pulse. All right. So if we were analyzing this, you could, you know, I don't know, it's not even a six second strip, so we're not. You've got a rhythm there, but it doesn't mean a lot because he has no pulse. All right, the algorithm. All right, so it's going to be cardiac arrest algorithm, PEA. Most important, keep that CPR pumping. How long? Until he dies. Well, yeah, I mean, in the grand scheme of things, but I'm talking about like with okay, deep cycle. All right, ventilations. It doesn't have to be intubation. Ventilations. IV started. First medication. One milligram of epi one to ten thousand, which would be how many milliliters? Ten. All right, fluids are going. History reveals the patient is a chronic alcoholic. He also you also find out from from I guess his wife showed up on the scene that he's been sick for the last few days. He's been vomiting blood and has black tarry stool. His abdomen is distended and rigid. Okay, so we've got a PEA, cardiac <coughs> arrest, but now we've got some more information here. So that's going to help. This answered a couple of questions related to what? Huh? Fluid replacement. All right, fluid replacement, so your H's and T's, right? Mm -hmm. All right, so chronic alcoholic, he may have some kind of nutritional issue, liver issue or something like that. He's been sick for a few days and vomiting blood and has black tarry stool, so that tells me that number one, he's probably hypovolemic. Number two, he's probably anemic, right? Mm -hmm. So those both are gonna have huge factors over perfusion, all right? His abdomen is distended and rigid, so that gives me more of, of a, a reason to believe GI bleeding, hypovolemia. So what, what are some things that you would do for this guy? All right, thiamine, how much? Well, that's been a long time since we've talked about thiamine, isn't it? 100 milligrams. All right, sodium bicarbonate. Sodium, bi bi sodium bicarb. What is your dose for sodium bicarb? Okay, all right. Maybe D50. You don't know, we can, we can do that. All right, 25 grams, all right. And then fluids, that's gonna kinda of cover our H's and T's. We're gonna keep doing CPR, epi, checking. Remember though, it's also very important that when you have a cardiac arrest algorithm, <coughs> every two minutes you check, if you do have a, a shockable rhythm, go ahead and shock, but then immediately go back to what? CPR. CPR. All right.
68-year-old female. This one is, is one I would listen to here for sure. Um, 68-year-old female patient was found unresponsive on floor and is now awake but not communicating. Not because this is that scenario is in fifth death, but because of some of the information here. Husband states that she has an irregular heart rate chronically and takes medicine for it. 68-year-old female patient found unresponsive on floor, now awake but not communicating. Husband states she has an irregular heart rate and takes medicine for it. Where are you shifting gears to already? I'm, I'm going ahead and, and thinking, hey, we got some neurological issues here. She does have a history of an irregular heart rate. Let's, let's do a quick assessment because time is important. Consciously responds to commands, but she does have expressive aphasia. What does that mean? Not facial droop, expressive aphasia. All right. All right. So, so with aphasia, that's going to be difficulty speaking, right? And expressive aphasia, she's not able to, to correlate what she's trying to communicate with you. All right. That, that would be an instance, and, and I remember one in particular very clearly. It was a, a um, I don't know, like a 50-something year old male that, that I took care of. He had a stroke, and, and, and I was taking care of him in the unit. And he came into us, and as far as any other deficit, he didn't have the facial droop. He didn't have, like, weakness or anything like that. But you'd go and say, hey, Mr. So-and-so, how are you today? And you can see he's processing what he wants to say. Then he says... Cat, dog, car, house, uh, uh, over there, uh, when he's trying to say, I'm not feeling good or something, he, he, can't, he can't get out what he's trying to say. All right? So, what now? Just a reminder of what we got here. There's your monitor. So if you had it right here in front of you, you would see that this is an irregularly irregular rhythm. You've got a fibrillating, fibrillating baseline. You've got him laying still. You know that every monitor lead is hooked up correctly. And you still have that. Blood pressure, 212 over 122. Uh, let's, let's pretend like that blood pressure is 142 over 90. It, it doesn't matter. <laughs> It doesn't matter. Um, I mean, I guess in the grand scheme of things, somebody's blood pressure doesn't matter, but that's a misprint. Okay. What do we got? ATO. Now, here's something that that you need to consider. Yes, um, that is that is that is critical that you you realize that that it is ATO, but she's got these other neurological symptoms going on. So we're certainly not going to try to do anything with this rhythm. That's not our priority right now. It's irregularly irregular. Normal P waves are absent. PRI is not discernible. You do have a QRS strip as a fib. What do you think is going on with it? What kind of stroke? Ischemic stroke, CVA. All right. So what are we going to do here? Because this is important. I, would, I, I wish this was more pushed towards the, the, the medical stuff, but AHA does have a stroke guideline. All right. Well, uh, blood pressure is okay because I said don't worry about the 200. It's 140 over 90. Okay, so we're certainly going to start, but before we call the stroke team, there's several questions we got to answer. We got to get that information. All right. It says you will use the unstable tachycardia algorithm, and that's if we were trying to go more towards the, the, the cardiac treatment here. But there's a much bigger fish to fry with, with this person. I need to go back and revisit this. But the HA stroke protocol is very important. One of the first things you need to do if you've got help is to go ahead and get that, that, that stroke filled out. All right. Just like we say that that, that with with cardiac uh, MI things like that, time is muscle, time is brain when it comes to stroke. 
So with the tachycardia, if you felt the need to, to treat the tachycardia, you followed that algorithm. But here's your CVA algorithm, and you really can't, can't see it. But what do you do? The big things for us, the big thing for you in the field right now is going to be identifying this quickly, which you already did, getting in touch with the stroke center, finding the appropriate facility, whether we need to fly them out or we need to, to take them by ground, all right? Glucose, check glucose, all right? Do your neurologic assessment. Um, then they need to get to the hospital. But there's one question, there's one question that you need to try to get answered. The onset, the last time they were seen normal, and can you pinpoint a time where these signs and symptoms were really noticeable when you, when you notice these things going on? That is a very important question that you need to ask because that can have a lot of bearing, especially with an embolotic stroke. Embolic strokes, all right? reasons why the, the doctor signed off on that and that's something that as a matter of fact me and Lance were talking the other day that I wanted to figure out. Now I will say this if you go back and, and this patient has a blood pressure 212 over 110 and uh, she doesn't have um, AFib but it's just some other rhythm but she's showing signs and symptoms of stroke. You messed up. You done messed up A.A. Ron if you, if you give lots of fluid. Trying to say that quietly because I'm recording. <laughs> All right, case four. Patient, 70 year old male, alter mental status weakness. Find a 70 year old male who is confused. Family states he is weak and dizzy when he stands. Patient's 160 pounds. Watching TV, stood up and became weak and dizzy. This has continued and he is becoming more confused. He's got a history of heart trouble but doesn't take any medications. What now? Monitor. Monitor shows this. <clears throat> All right, respiratory rate's 32. Blood pressure is 106 over 48. A couple of things here. He keeps becoming weak and dizzy, and has continu this has continued and is becoming more confused. All right. What algorithm? Well, what's the strip? Sinus variety. What algorithm? All right, what's the first thing that you do after you do your monitoring and your oxygen and all that good stuff? Atropine. Atropine, 0 0.5 milligrams, up to 3 milligrams max. Transcute pacing, what do we set the rate at? 70. Increase the milliamps till we get captured. Or dopamine, it's... 2 to 20 mics or epinephrine, which is 2 to 10 mics. All right. I'm going to trust that Miss Duncan has done the dopamine formula with you guys. I gave you the easy way. I'm not going to do this. If y'all want, if, if anybody wants to do the long, if you're still struggling with the dopamine formula, because there may be some eventually on the test you take. Please get with me and we'll sit down and do it. All right. All right. Just really quickly, we're not going to spend a lot of time with this, but really quickly with strict interpretation. All right, what's your rate? All right. Regular or irregular? You got a P wave? Yeah. 
What about your PRI? I know y'all can't really count it too well, but does it look like it's yeah. all right? First degree AV block with sinus sinus rhythm was the first degree AV block. All right. What do you got right here? And this is where I caution you because everybody first looked at this. First looked at this. But you've got to do your full thing here. Note that you've got, which this is the exact same strip we had earlier in, in the thing. All right? Third degree AV block. All right? What about this guy? Second degree type 1, aka Mobitz 1 or Winky Bop. Winky Bop. Oh, this one's easy. Mm -hmm. Ventricular tachycardia, anybody not know that? If not, you need to come see me after. Ooh, this one's. Torsades de Pointes. Alright, what about this guy right here? Alright, what makes you just jump out and say junctional? Alright, inverted P wave. What about the rate? Well, this is a six second strip. One, two, three, four, five, six. You got a rate of 60. Alright, alright, alright. Alright, here we go because this is going to lead us into a quick 12 lead review. 54 year old male, executive of an insurance company, of an insurance company. <coughs> Complaining of chest tightness radiating to his left arm for the last two and a half hours. He's also complaining of slight shortness of breath. He has no previous history, but does have a remarkable family history of CV disease. Skin's pale and moist. Blood pressure is 104 over 82. Pulse is 102. Respirations are 20 with good tidal volume. Pulse ox is 99% and his lungs are clear. Nothing really just stands out except probably this right here. Blood pressure. Chest pain is getting worse. What do you do? Monitor and go ahead just as habit. No, no. I'm talking about, no, 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 no. I'm talking about with your monitor as habit. 12 lead. There's no bypassing that. 12 lead. We can't do nitro yet because we have no what? Follow that, but I'm going to make sure I have something before I do that. A line, all right. Here you go. So, where do I see the big? All right, two, three, AVF. Where are my reciprocal leads I need to look at for at least two, three, AVF? One in AVL. We got some depression there, a little bit of depression there. But the big deal here is that leads 2, 3, ABF, they're contiguous leads, all right? Lead 2, 75, rhythm regular, P wave, upright, PRI, 0 0.24, QRS, greater or less than 0 0.10. According to the rules, it's a sinus rhythm except for that one thing. Individual leads, and what do you notice? You are so smart. Y'all have already noticed that. ST elevation leads 2, 3, AVF. And what are we going to call it? <laughs> Inferior. Inferior. All right. Now, now, we're in inferior, so we just, we say, hey, just to be safe, you know what the paramedic does it, but we just out of school and we know that when we see inferior MI, we might want to get a right-sided 12 lead. It's fine. It doesn't indicate any right-sided involvement. All right. So we talked about possible diagnosis. What algorithm will you use? American Heart Association Coronary Algorithm, ACS, all right. What would be your initial pre-hospital care treatments in order? Oxygen. 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 IV. Nitro. 
and then consider morphine. All right. Would there not be not just the twelve essential about this that you need to do just like you did with the CBA. A STEMI check sheet, right? And we also need to be what with that 12 lead? Do what with that 12 lead? We need to transmit that 12 lead. We need to make sure they get it and we need to get with the hospital. All right? Right side 12 lead indicates no right ventricular involvement. Uh, this is old. I wouldn't recommend high flow oxygen. Y'all know my stance on that. Give them a little bit of oxygen if you need to, but not, not high flow. Um, aspirin, IV, nitro, morphine. Chest pain slightly better. If it had not gotten better, what would you have considered? Checking blood pressure and then consider more nitro. Also, You've got a range of morphine, so you may have given your lower range of morphine, so you still got a little bit that you can give, right? Is morphine category A or B for chest pain? A. a. It is A. Morphine is not that dangerous of a drug if you're monitoring them. Even something like fentanyl that is much more potent than, than morphine, it's not that dangerous if you're doing things right, if you're monitoring them. All right? One of the things that, that I do want you guys to take out of this class, and, and I feel like you're, you're, you're getting there, is, is understanding at least the basic, the 12 lead. When you get a 12 lead, identifying the areas of injury or, or infarct or ischemia. Injury, ischemia, or infarct. Remember that your chest leads are unipolar, right? They all form a common negative, and then they view from the different... Um, aspects of the left ventricle for a normal 12 lead. B1, B2 is going to be what? Alright, B3, B4. B5, B6. If I've got a 12 lead on, lead 1 in AVL is going to be what? High lateral and then leads 2, 3 in AVF are going to be not low lateral, just when I say low lateral. Inferior. 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 All right, so I think y'all got that down. All right, here's an example of an anteroceptal. Anteroceptal, so if it's anteroceptal, where am I looking at? What leads? V1, V2, V3, V4. All right. What about your bundle branch blocks? What what lead is the best lead for bundle branch block? V1. Rabbit ears are not reliable. Remember the, those RSR waves, the or the RSR prime waves. However, they are a pretty good indication if you're looking at them in V1. Now, also very important that you note know with your um, with your QRS if you're looking for bundle branch blocks greater than. 120 milliseconds or 0.12, all right? So with this one, you don't have those, those prime waves. You do have a little bit of a slurred S wave, but you've also got a wider QRS, but one of the things about it is is that you've got this QRS that is going downwards in V1, V2. So that's going to be a left on the branch block. Alright, so to do your left, go to B1, identify the J point. Which way does QRS complex go from the J point? Down. Alright, that's the turn signal approach. Alright, what about your right bundle branch? Does not cause ST elevation. You will probably evaluate the ST segments as normal, but look at your uh, J point, and if you've got a positive QRS from that J point and other indications of of it, then it's going to be right. Now, here's here is is one of the things. There, you got your RSR wave here, but it's very little. You can't see it, but you certainly can see it in V2. So that's 
See what I'm talking about there? And that goes back to the question that I asked earlier. That says, why on a normal tracing do you only see one waveform even though you've got two areas that are, are, are um, contracting? And that's because of the syncium. They're in it together. However, with a bundle branch block, and in this case a right bundle branch block, the left bundle branch is depolarizing the left ventricle a lot quicker than the right side does. So the left side gets depolarized, then it comes back and it depolarizes the right side going around the block. All right? So that's what, that, that's kind of the quick review on those. All right? Um, my videos. Oh. Well, your dynamic waves here, your AFib, you're looking for your fibrillating baseline. This is a 4 to 1 conduction. Now remember, it's not always going to be textbook. Remember, your patients don't always read the textbook. All right. Winky Bob. Progressively prolonging and then drop a beat. All right. And then last but not least. Your adult immediate post-cardiac post arrest care. There's a couple of things that, that you need to remember with this. Number one, number one is that post-cardiac arrest, this patient is probably still going to be in cardiogenic shock. That's why you have some of your vasopressors on this algorithm, right? You, that's why you've got dopamine or, or a epinephrine infusion or norepinephrine. All right, leave a fed. All right. Also, one of the critical things we need to be able to identify in the field: when do we initiate hypothermia? When do we initiate therapeutic hypothermia? Couple of inclusion criteria. Number one, it needs to be a witness arrest, and they need to initially have been in a shockable rhythm. They needed to be shot, so you need to get that information if you show up and they're working that on the field. You've got be fed, be tech. Number two, if you get return of spontaneous circulation, but that patient does not get any neurofunction back, if that person is like a Gray's Anatomy episode and you work the cardiac arrest and they come back around and talk to you, there's no need to do therapeutic hypothermia because their neurofunction is, is, is working. But if they have no neuro, if, if they're not showing signs of neuro, um, then we start considering therapeutic hypothermia because why do we do therapeutic hypothermia? Not necessarily to preserve heart, but to preserve neuro. We drop the body temperature down so that metabolism is not required as much. There's not as much energy required for metabolism. So your inclusion criteria is going to be important. It needs to be a witness to rest. Um, they need it to be in a shockable rhythm. And then if you get return spontaneous circulation, they need to have no neurofunction, all right? So just a couple of questions and we're out of here. What, somebody, one person, describe pulseless electrical activity. Pulse. Disassociation between the electrical activity and the mechanical. All right, so a disassociation between the electrical activity and the mechanical activity, the mechanical function. So essentially, pulseless electrical activity, we've got electrical function, but we do not have mechanical function. And the mechanical function is what causes the pulse. All right? What's the difference between PEA and a systole? All right, all right. Say it again. All right, so a systole is a complete absence of any type of electrical activity in the heart. What is the treatment for both? CPR. CPR and epinephrine. Scratch that vasopressin. I need to fix that. All right, unsynchronized cardioversion. Unsynchronized cardioversion is defibrillation. Fibrillation. We know that intervention that's uh, used to interrupt uh, chaotic rhythms by simultaneously depolarizing all cardiac tissue in hopes of allowing the SA node to resume the function of the primary pacemaker. So, somebody else, explain synchronized cardioversion. Don't be scared. If you're wrong, I'll tell you you're wrong. All right, so it is, it sinks on the R wave. Why do we want it to sink on the R wave? 
All right. So, syn synchronized cardioversion. Intervention used to interrupt rapid, organized, and hemodynamically unstable rhythms such as SVT and atrial fibrillation. It is synchronized to deliver energy precisely <coughs> at the peak of the R wave to capitalize on the already depolarized state of the ventricles. We want to make sure that we're hitting right when they are depolarizing. What is the electrical dose for synchronized cardioversion? Narrow complex. All right. Narrow irregular is 120 to 200. And wide regular is 100. Narrow irregular being like an atrial fibrillation with a rapid ventricular response. All right. What is the absolute refractory period? You have not hit another depolarization. All right. So the absolute refractory period is a time during the cardiac cycle in which no outside influence, no sim, uh, no um, stimulation can can create a, a depolarization of the cardiac cycle. You do have that relative refractory period, though, which is a dangerous spot, because what can happen? If a stimulus hits on the relative refractory period, the cardiac cells are not deep finished um, repolarizing. They're not back to their rest and potential, so you could have a partial depolarization, which could cause chaos. All right? What are your limb leads? <laughs> All right, leads one, two, three, AVR, AVL, AVF. So what are your chest leads or your precordial leads? Which leads make up Eindhoven's triangle? Leads one, two, and three. What is inotropy? All right, so if I give a medication that has positive inotropic effects. So it's a medication that will increase the contractile force. It affects the force in which the heart muscle contracts. What is chronotropy? All right, it refers to the rate of movement of the heart and then dromotropy. All right. So it influences the conduction of electrical impulses. A positive dromotropic agent enhances the conduction of electrical impulses. All right, I think we've already hit this good for the atropine, epinephrine, sympatho, or a sympathetic agent. And then what type of medication is dopamine? Sympathomimetic, increases rate and force myocardial contraction. So if it increases rate, it has positive chronotropic, and if it increases force of myocardial contraction, it has positive inotropic. All right.